please welcome Reverend Kevin Jessup, President of Global Strategic Alliance and co-chair for the return. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you for this time that we have today to come into your presence, Lord. We pray for a covering of your protection. Thank you. <laughs> we pray for that covering of your protection. A Psalm 91, divine protection over this land. May we abide in the shadow of the Almighty in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Today, America is at a four-lane crossroads. These four lanes include political, religious, moral, and cultural transitions. America is at a critical turning point in history. It has forgotten its heritage, its values, its morality, its integrity, and the eternal rules of order and right. This nation was founded upon the word of God that the pilgrims brought to America aboard the Mayflower and embedded in the Mayflower Compact. In the history, only two nations were tied together by covenants with God. God made a covenant with Israel, but America made a covenant with God. America has broken its covenant with God. And today, America is replaying an ancient judgment mystery that happened in the last days of ancient Israel before its destruction 2,700 years ago. Romans 11.25 tells us about the fullness of the Gentiles and other scriptures speak about the cup of iniquity. Based on the biblical template, the fullness of America will arrive, I believe, when four events converge. Here they are very quickly. God's sovereign purpose for the nation has been completed. Number two, the inhabitants of the land reject the Bible and its principles. Number three, people in the nation no longer repent and harden their hearts to the truth. And number four, abominations become legal and acceptable laws to the majority of the people. With these four actions, Converge and unite at the same time, the fullness of time may have arrived. America may not be destroyed or cease to exist, but when national sin and rejection of God's laws persist, according to the pattern of ancient Israel, the following five things will happen. Number one, God will permit the nation to be ruled by bad leaders. Number two, God will permit strangers to rise higher than his own people. Number three, God will not deliver us from those who hate us. Number four, God will allow economic challenges. And number five, God will lift his hand of protection to allow national or natural disasters rather to take place. The purpose of all this distress is to lead people ultimately to repentance by the mercy of God himself. So when national sins overtake the majority in a nation's population, as it did in the days of Noah, scriptures tell us the cup of iniquity becomes full and often the fullness of iniquity is a trigger which releases the fullness of time. It's cup, it, so in, in, this is, leads quickly to the collapse of nations and empires. America is currently in that same series of parallel cycles as we know history often repeats itself. So in a nutshell, America's fullness of time, its cup of iniquity is so full that it's teetering on the edge. And the things that happened in ancient Israel before its destruction are now happening in America, including the plagues. But there is a covenant. There's an everlasting covenant that we made with God and today we are re renewing that covenant. In Jeremiah 32, 28 and other scriptures throughout the ancient text, it says, they shall be my people and I shall be their God. And today we are calling upon the Holy Spirit to breathe upon this nation as a righteous remnant of believers are gathering together under the <laughs> presence of the Almighty. Hallelujah. When we started the renewal, it was based on three scriptures. God gave us uh, Exodus 1.8, which says a new king came to power in Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he forced the Hebrews to work as slaves. We're watching today that very thing beginning to take place. In Deuteronomy 1.8, it says, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and their offspring after them. 
Today, our task is to repossess the land as those pilgrims did four centuries ago. That is why, and that is what, and now let me tell you how. In Acts 1-8, and that's why January the 8th, 1-8, these three 1-8 scriptures were the foundation of today's renewal. In Acts 1-8, it tells us how to do this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it, but he's already done it. We rest in the finished work that he completed at the cross and he's infusing his body with faith like we've never seen before. From the time of the Israelites through the days of the prophets, through the days of the judges, even in Hebrews in the New Testament, it's not a book called Christianity. It's a book called Hebrews, by the way. And it says, there is yet a to be entered into. God is now allowing his righteous remnant to enter into that rest, which is based upon the finished work of the cross, which he's already completed. So we get in the yoke with him. He pulls the load and the Holy Spirit is superintending on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. God the Father is in heaven. Jesus is at his right hand ever interceding for us. And the third part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, is down here on earth superintending the perfect will of the Father. So when we know what our assignment is and we align with the perfect will of the Father, the Holy Spirit says to Jesus, this, these people are aligned. We the people are aligned with the perfect will of the Father. And Jesus tells that to the Father. And the Father says to Jesus, you tell the Holy Spirit on earth. Let's have a heaven to earth work. Let's open divine healing. Let's open the treasuries of heaven. Let's open the power of an almighty Holy Spirit to lead and guide and comfort and counsel us. In Jesus' name, we will take this nation back to the throne of God. Hallelujah. Zechariah 3 9 says this in God's word I will engrave its inscription declares the Lord of hosts and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day and here we are on January 8th and on this day the iniquity of this land we call it oh God by the power of your Holy Spirit wash us clean by the blood of the Holy Spirit and Lord by when, your, when your wind of the Spirit begins to move may we set our sails to catch your wind and take our ships safely home to port hallelujah living in the shadow of the almighty in Psalm 91 1 it says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty the psalmist writes of the secret place of the most high and abiding under the shadow of the almighty and here today we're calling that shadow of the almighty to cover America We're calling the Holy Spirit to begin to pour out the latter rain. We're praying for great and mighty things that we know not of. He promises a latter rain outpouring. We're believing God for the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. In the midst of the darkness, God said, I will arise for the sake of my own name. Hallelujah. What does that covenant mean? What does the ark mean to us today? The ark of the covenant no longer sits in Moses' tabernacle or David's tent or Solomon's temple, whether it was lost over time or stolen by invading armies or hidden under the temple mount, we may never really know. However, the purpose of the ark was to provide a picture of the future atonement through the Messiah. Let's look at it real quick. Within the ark of the covenant, there were three sacred items stored within the gold box from the time of Moses. A golden pot of manna, the stone tablets of the law of God, and the rod of Aaron that had blossomed and produced almonds, as we see in Hebrews 9.4. Each item was a prophetic picture of a spiritual blessing that would be imparted to believers under this new covenant. Number one, manna. Christ is the living bread, which came down from heaven. In John 6.51, it tells us this. Thus, the manna in the wilderness that sustained the nation was a preview of the living bread that would bring the gift of eternal life to all who would partake of his body and his blood, according to John 6. Hallelujah. 
Number two, the word of God. Christ says that man lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In Matthew 4, 4, the tablets of the law, the ark of the covenant were the law or the word of God. It's now written, it was written in stone, but now when we as believers are saved by grace, we learn to live by the words of God. We uphold his statutes and his commandments because it's in our hearts to do so. And number three, the rod of Aaron, this dead tree branch in the hands of a man of God was the instrument used to produce miracles as we see in Exodus 7, 12. The rod is a picture of the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in the believer. And because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit and the ark that rested on the stone floor in the Holy of Holies, that was a picture of Christ himself, the living manna and the word made flesh. And that word made flesh sent the Holy Spirit with his nine gifts and nine fruits. And just as the rod of Aaron blossomed and produced fruit, believers who receive the Holy Spirit will also produce spiritual fruit in their lives. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. He didn't leave us alone, but he gave us a guide. Hallelujah. Our spiritual blessings are received and enjoyed when we enter the presence of God. However, blessings often come with battles, and our battles are often precede spiritual breakthroughs. Thus, there is a mystery associated with why the righteous suffer and the purpose of struggles and conflicts and battles in our life. But the outcome of victory through Christ is sure, and we learn to abide under the shadow of God's wings. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. In the shadow of thy wings I will make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Oh, praise the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Please welcome Pastor Carter Conlon of Times Square Church. Praise God. Father, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that is here. Thank you for the touch of heaven that you are willing to place on your word as it is spoken and received into each of our hearts. Thank you, mighty God, for bringing us to this place, Lord, of understanding that the prayers of even the most feeble saint of God can move your hand and move your heart. We appeal to you, Lord, on behalf of a backslidden nation, a nation that has defaulted in the covenant that our founders made with you. We come to you, Lord, this day, God, and we ask that you would gladden our hearts and fill each heart with faith. Give us the ability to understand your willingness to show mercy one more time. We ask you, Lord, for a mercy moment for this nation, for our families, for our marriages, for our children, for our government, for every part of this country. We recognize that we have fallen far short of the glory that was intended for us. But oh God, we ask that you would give us one more opportunity to glorify your name again within our borders. Start with each of our lives, every one of us that are gathered here today. God, take us in our littleness and just as you multiplied a little boy's lunch and fed thousands, would you multiply that which you've planted within each one of our hearts? And God, would you feed this generation through your church? Would you help us to glorify you? Or would you help us to lift our voices to you? Would you help us to live in a way that honors you? Would you help us, my God, to believe you, Lord, in the face of what seems to be insurmountable adversity? Give us the grace to believe that you are willing to be God to us one more time. Help us, Lord, to focus on what is good and what is virtuous and what is of noble, nobility and what is of good report. And your promise is that you'll crush Satan under our feet shortly. My God, my God, my God, my God, we're not here to play games with you. We're not here to waste our time nor yours. This is a holy moment. Speak to every heart, speak to every life. Give me the ability to convey the words that you've given me to share today. Override my frailty. 
and touch, oh God, this physical body and touch the limitations of my mind. Lord, no one needs to hear my voice today because my voice is limited, but yours can create a galaxy. I ask you, Lord God, to take the thoughts you've given to me and multiply them thousands of ways and speak into every heart and to every life. People who are gathered here in this physical facility and those that are listening online. Oh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, the cry of our heart is glorify your name again in this time, in this generation. Give us the grace that we're all going to need to stand in a way that will truly bring glory to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share with you today, beginning at uh, the Gospel of John chapter 15, the words of Jesus spoken to the people of his time, but have an equal application to you and I today. I want you to think about these words in the context of each of our lives individually, but also in the context of us as a nation of people. Here are the words that Jesus spoke in John chapter 15, beginning at verse four. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. We cannot honor God. We don't have the power in ourselves to live for God. We can't be a demonstration of who God is without the presence of Christ himself in the power of God's Holy Spirit residing within us and manifesting as it is the glory of God through our lives. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And I think we're wise to look at the context of this particular verse and as we see the burning in our cities on the increase, we see the incivility, we see the rioting, we see the restlessness of the young people of this generation and maybe come to the conclusion, have we really been abiding in Christ? Has he really been in us? Or have we just been talking about him while living lives that are somewhat disjointed from him? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is the cry of my heart now, oh God, as David the Psalmist once prayed, search my heart, O oh God, and see me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of life everlasting. Because the scripture does bear witness that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person can avail much. One righteous man, one righteous woman has the power historically to move the hand of God. One Esther, one Moses, one Elijah, one person. An old man like Moses, a young boy like David, it doesn't matter. Somebody, somebody somewhere that says, God, I'm making the choice to let you be God in my life. And I'm going to let you have every corner of my heart. And I'm going to every day ask you to challenge the thoughts in my mind. Because God, I don't want my prayers bouncing off the ceiling. I want to be able to pray in a way that touches your hand. And just as the scepter moved towards Esther, I want to be one of those persons that can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in this season of need that we're now living in. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciples. About 400 years ago, a small band of pilgrims headed out searching for a land of freedom that they believed that God was leading them to, a place where they could worship God in the freedom of conscience and according to the word of God without being dictated to about what they could believe from the top down, that the word of God was going to become their guide. They believed that God was leading them to a place where they would form a new society that would truly glorify God on the earth. And we've heard it so eloquently spoken about throughout this day today that they formed a compact before they even landed on the shores of Plymouth in the year 1620, that they would be building a nation as they hoped 
that would bring glory to God on the earth and it would advance the Christian faith. And this is the cornerstone of America. Nobody can debate this who has an intelligent mind. This is the cornerstone upon which our present society was founded, that they would plant a nation that would be there and would bring glory to God and the advancement of the Christian faith. John Winthrop, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630 said these words, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of all people are upon us. Isn't that true of America? The eyes of the world have been upon this nation for a long, long time. The eyes of the world have longingly looked from their own borders to the borders of a nation that was truly blessed by God, given abilities beyond our natural ability to do things that we were a, a melting pot of cultures, to do things in 400 short years that other cultures weren't able to do in thousands of years, simply because the hand of God was upon us as a nation. And people from all different countries and cultures throughout the world looked at America with, and they were willing to risk life and limb to get here because there was something about the nation. God truly was being glorified and we truly were, as the scripture says, a city set upon a hill. But Winthrop also warned us. He said, the eyes of all people will be upon us if we deal falsely with our God in this work we've undertaken and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. In other words, this great nation founded by God on the principle of glorifying God would become the laughing stock of the world. Now, I don't know if we've arrived there yet, but we're dreadfully close to being the laughing stock right now because of all of the things that are going on in our present day. In other words, Jesus said, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And today we see our cities being set on fire. Our young people are burning with uncontrolled and unbridled passions in our streets. We see this insatiable lust that's gotten hold of our families and marriages so that people no longer consider any form of commitment to be something to be desired. The early settlers covenanted to honor God, but I want to ask a question today. Did they truly honor God in this covenant and have we honored God? Now I'm going to speak collectively as a nation. I understand as you do that great good has been done through this nation in 400 years. Missionaries have been sent around the world. The United States of America has been a place that has been known for its kindness and in some measure its sacrifice. But I want to look collectively at this country and ask this question, did they honor God and have we honored God? Bradford wrote these words at the end of his life and let me read it to you from a historical account of his, the end of his life. He said, towards the end of his long life, he was, if anything, deeply disappointed that his hopes appeared not to have been achieved. Instead of winning Native Americans to Christ by example and preaching the gospel, too often the tribes have been treated shamefully as Christian teaching time and again gave way to expediency in the ways of the world. And this by people from New Plymouth, not just by outsiders. And rather than removing the youngsters from temptation by leaving the ungodly United Provinces, the separatists saw them fall more and more into the trap of greed and materialism. And though they had sought to distance themselves from a repressive regime and gain freedom to serve God and worship as they pleased, intolerance could be an ugly sore in their own communities as well. Now this is one of the first governors who was looking at the end of his days and, and lamenting in some measure that we, we were called to be this city set upon a hill. We're called to build a society that was going to become something that glorified God in the earth. And we promised that we would do this, but Bradford looked and he said, our promises began to fail even from the inception. We started to treat people who showed us kindness when we arrived on their shores, we started to treat them shamefully. And not too long after, those who came here under the seeking freedom in America began to take slaves to themselves. I'm going to speak about our society. I'm going to speak about this nation in the course of history. And we took slaves unto ourselves. Having come here for freedom, and then taking another 
whole group of people, an entire people group, and making them slaves and subservient to our desires to build this just society. And tragically, much of that was done in the name of God. You talk about spiritual ignorance in a nation. To take away people's freedom and do it in the name of God. And then conscience, we've always been a nation that God could reason with. As Isaiah, the Lord said to Isaiah, to the people of God of his time, he said, come and let us reason together. Though your sins as red as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. And so the reasoning took, took form, the, the form of argument and conscience. It brought this nation into a civil war. And yes, the slaves were set free, but sad to say, for many, they were set free with reluctance. And we committed the sin of Cain as a nation. Cain, who murdered his own brother. And when the Lord came to Cain and said, where is, where is your brother? His blood is crying out from the ground. And Cain says, how should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? And you think of the, the indifference of setting free a people whom we held captive and yet offering no real solid support structure to these people to start up families and businesses and to own land, just set them out. Of course, we're still suffering the consequences of that in our present generation. In America, God blessed us beyond measure, but as a society, we forgot him. We left off reality, and we were drawn into fiction through entertainment. And we opened ourselves to the gross immorality that Hollywood has baptized this nation in. And because of it, we began to lust for pleasure without responsibility. We became a sexually addicted society. Everyone wanted sexual pleasure, but nobody, very few wanted the responsibility that comes from commitment and the creation of life. And 63 million children have paid the price in the womb for our lust for pleasure without responsibility. Have we honored God in this society? Have we been a society set upon a hill? Have we done that which has brought his name to reputation throughout the world? And then we gave our surviving children to be taught by many who don't know Christ, who don't know God. And just as in the days of Israel under Egypt, where the firstborn sons, where the sons that were born to the people of God were being thrust into a river, we allowed our children to be thrown into the river of gender confusion. We allowed them to be placed under the influence of people who deny the existence of God and deny them the knowledge of God. We allowed them to be put in places where they're forbidden to pray, mocked if they try to serve the living God, and even in sporting events, they cannot bend their knee to God without paying a penalty and consequence for it. And if that's not bad enough, we begin to radicalize our young people in our colleges and universities across the country to hate God, to hate one another, and to hate their country. Have we been a city set upon a hill? Then we took the institution of marriage, the closest type the Apostle Paul says to Christ in his church. This institution that was supposed to be a representation of, of him, his commitment and his love to his bride. And we turned marriage into that which God says it ought not to be. And lastly, we elected people to high office who despise both Christ and the word of God as a nation. We voted them as a people group, as a society. We voted the people who are in power today into power. Not everyone, I understand that. I'm speaking generally as a society. People who hate Christ, they hate God. They hate the word of God. They hate the standards of God. They want nothing to do with God, but we put them into the office that they're in today. So my question today is, are we truly a city set upon a hill? Have we honored God? Have we brought the name of Christ to reputation. We're not a righteous society, and I'm, I'm tired of hearing commentators in the political arena and on news conferences and such like talking about, we are Americans, we are a virtuous people, we are a righteous people, we are a kind people, we are a merciful people. We are none of these things. We're not a righteous society in America anymore because we have broken our part of the covenant. We made a promise to God on that ship and we, made, we continued that promise when we landed on the shores that this would be a nation that brought his name to reputation. That the, the foundation of this nation would be for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that God would be our God and we would be his people and we would be the people entering into a covenant to serve him, to love him, to live for him 
and to bring his name into reputation in the earth. Daniel, the great prophet of God, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 7, lamenting the condition of his own people of the time, recognizing a mercy moment was on the horizon, but knowing why they had spent 70 years in captivity. Daniel prayed this prayer. He said, oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it is this day. We, Daniel says, we are ashamed. We can't lift our faces. We have no boast to make before you. The only hope that we have is your mercy. In America, we made the same fundamental error as God's people of old in ancient Israel once did. And here's the error we made, thinking that in ourselves, by sheer force of effort and will, that we could be godly without a daily dependence on God himself. It's not within us to be godly in ourselves. We need an interior dwelling power of God's word and God's Holy Spirit in us. Because left to ourselves, we will go the other way. We will not do what God's called us to do. And this is what we have done as a nation. We committed the sin of pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before our fall. It is the original sin that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. Somehow biting into the theological lie that without God, we can be godly. We can't be godly without God. We can't be godly without an honest relationship with the living God. We can't be godly by not allowing the, the Holy Spirit to be our strength and the word of God to be our guide. Israel tried so hard to retain their sense of virtue and be godly by, by sheer force of will only to end up hating the Son of God when he came and by casting him out of their borders. They hated him. They, they tried so hard to be the people of God. Then when he came and he challenged their deficiency, they became angered with him and said, how dare you declare our religion to be deficient? How dare you to tell us that we're full of dead men's bones and all of our, our ceremonies and all of our righteousness and all of our robes are worth nothing in the sight of a holy God? How dare you indict us as this, yet it was God himself who had come in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. They hated him because they were trying so hard to be godly in their own strength. If God should visit us today, if this should be the day that God marks as a day of beginning of a spiritual moment of mercy or an awakening in America today, and if Christ himself were standing in this pulpit and told us that only by abiding in him can we be saved, and become that city set upon a hill. Would we be offended by that? Would, be, would we be offended if his presence exposed our spiritual bankruptcy? Would we, would we be offended if we, we, we had to lump ourselves in as Daniel did and said, we have sinned against you, God. Would, would we be offended at the, the holiness of God pointing out the fact that we made promises, but we didn't keep them? We make promises and we can't keep them. We're, we're not God in ourselves. Or would we say, blessed to see who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said to his own people, he stood looking at Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you under my wings as a hen would gather her baby chicks under her wings, but you would not come. Behold, your house is left to you desert, desolate. You'll not see me again till you say, blessed to see who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the cry of my heart. Oh God, we have failed, we have sinned, we have fallen short of your glory. But oh God, to us belongs shame of face, but to you belongs mercy. And you told us to come to your throne of grace, not in the time when we have it all together, but in a time when we know that we have failed and we need the grace of Almighty God. So I'm coming, I don't care who comes to that throne, my God, I'm coming to your throne not in my strength, but in my weakness, not having done anything right, but having known that the only righteousness I possess is what you've given me by the covering of your blood. The only guidance I have is your word. The only strength I possess is in the power of your Holy Spirit inside of my life. There's another passage in the Old Testament where there was a season where the nation of Israel was coming under the judgment of God. Listen to the terrible condition in Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, 
Say to her, you're a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. Listen to the spiritual condition of God's people, God's people, God's covenant people. The people through whom the whole world was supposed to be blessed. The people of Abraham. He says, the conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured the people. They've taken treasure and precious things and they've made many widows in her midst. The priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They've not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they've hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths and I'm profaned among them. Here's, here's a priesthood that rose up and they don't even mention the word sin any longer. No such a thing anymore in their theology as having sinned against a holy God. They lost an understanding of what is holy and what is not, what is clean and what is unclean. And they took away, in a sense, the living relationship that God wanted had, had with his people. Her princes, her, that's her political leaders in her midst, are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken." The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So you look at the condition of this nation and say, God, what could possibly be the hope for these people? And it comes to a verse that you, you really would never expect to be in the midst of this description. And the Lord says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found none. So this is God's, God's solution, God's remedy to this condition. I sought for a man. I, I searched. This, folks, this is the most religious nation on this time on the face of the earth. He's looking to show mercy to a nation that really doesn't deserve it. They've fallen so far short of the glory of God. They've become so corrupt in their dealings. From the top to the bottom, there's nothing but corruption. But yet, God says, I sought for a man. I, I looked for somebody. You can imagine his eyes, as the scripture says, searching to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of somebody whose heart is right towards him. Could it be said, would it be said of our generation that God came down to America and said, I sought for a man, I sought for a woman, I sought for a people, I sought for somebody to stand in the gap and make up a wall that I should not have to judge the nation. I sought for somebody that is not standing in their own strength. They're standing and they're appealing to the mercy of God. And this is, this is the, the, the very source of the prayer that comes from my heart now. I can't present any righteousness to God apart from that which he's given me in Christ Jesus. But my prayer is God have mercy. God have mercy on our children. God have mercy on our families. Have mercy. There's a hundred million people in America that go to bed depressed. Many of them addicted to opiates now. They don't see a future. Our young people are dying at the top of every street. And the Lord's saying, I'm not looking for an army. I'm not looking for 100,000 people to gather in a stadium. I'm looking for one person. Could that be you, ma'am? Could that be you, sir? Are you willing to stand in the gap? Are you willing to go to the throne of God? Are you willing to be that, say, God, I, I don't know what I need to be, but I'm bringing you what I have. As this little boy once brought his lunch and you multiply it and you fed 10,000 people, my God, I'm bringing you the littleness of my life. The little bit of faith. I don't have a lot of faith. I've only got a mustard seed, but you said you could multiply it. I'm bringing you a heart that says, God, search me and change me and bring me in line with what is true. And Lord, because you promised that the, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person avails much. And so, Lord, I'm not coming here to play games. We don't have time to play games. We're on the edge now of something that is so dark, it's so deep, it's so fearful. The only thing that can stop it now is you. I'm talking to you now. I'm not talking about a thousand people or 10,000. It's you, it's a man, it's a woman of God. The only one that can stop destruction from coming into your home is you. The only one that can preserve your children from this onslaught of hell is you. The only one that can make a difference in your marriage is you. Our fathers 
Bradford said we're Englishmen which came across this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried to the Lord and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity. In 1620, 103 people landed on the shores of Plymouth, Massachusetts with a promise in their heart that God was going to give them this place where they could worship him freely. It would be a city set upon a hill. It would become the envy of the world. It would be something that brought glory to God and it would help to further the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. After one year, one year of being in this wilderness, half of them had died. There were only 51 left in 1621. And those 51 people gathered in a prayer meeting on a house that's now on lot number one, America. That's its address, lot one, America. They gathered in this house. I had the privilege of praying there on the 400th anniversary. 51 people that were half starved, 51 people whose hearts were full of sorrow, 51 people who had to fight through the doubts and unbeliefs of their own life and their own mind and their own heart, 51 people that had no go forward strategy, 51 people that were surrounded by enemies, they had no strength, they were so weak, they tied their dead to trees so their enemies would try, would, they believe would think they were more than they were. 51 people, and all, they, they couldn't make a single promise to God, nothing. Everything they thought they had was gone. And I wonder sometimes, did the Lord allow them to be brought down to that number so that they would never think it's by my own hand that this battle has been won? 51 people in the room. I don't know what their prayer sounded like, but I believe it must have sounded much like the prayer in Acts chapter 2 when, when 120 failures came into an upper room. 120 people who had promised that they would be with him. They would never forsake him. They would always be there. They were loyal. They could be depended on. Every one of them had failed him. Peter with his wonderful boasting of others may not follow you, but I will. They may run, but I won't. I'll go with you to Jerusalem and I'll die with you. John who leaned on his, his chest and told him how much he loved them. All of them fled at the point where they were needed. And so these 120 failures, like the 51 original inhabitants of Plymouth, Massachusetts, went into an upper room and began to pray. I don't know what their prayer sounded like, but if I was there, I would just say, God, I need you. We need you. We can't do this in our own strength. And you saw the beauty of it all under the new covenant. and the old covenant, we made promises to God, and God said, okay, if you, if you fulfill your promise, then I'll fulfill mine. That's Old Testament. Under the new covenant, God says, I don't want your promises to me. You can't keep them. Peter the Apostle says, we no longer live by making promises to God, but we now live by God's promises to us. And those 120 people went in that upper room as the 51 went into that prayer meeting saying, God, we can't promise you anything because we know we don't have the strength. We ran when you needed us. We didn't stand when we should have stood. We didn't do what we we're called to do. But oh God, to us belongs shame of face, like Daniel said. But Lord, to you belongs mercy. And so we ask you, Lord, to come and empower us. Come and give us your Holy Spirit. Come and raise us up. Come and make us more than we are. Come and make us more than we could ever be. And suddenly there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly the presence of God come because finally he had a people who understood it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's by my spirit this mountain will be moved. It's by my spirit this house will be built. And there will be a capstone put on it when it's finished. And you will shout grace, grace, grace to it. The goodness of God, the favor of God, the mercy of God, the power of God. It was all God. It was none of us. It was all God. All we had is a heart to believe him. All we had is our own weakness. And a heart that says, oh God, if you will give me the strength, I will serve you. I will stand for you, not in my strength, but in your strength. And suddenly the presence of God comes. 51 people step out of a hopeless room. It was a hopeless place. And of those 51, a nation of 330 something million people exists today. A nation that was brought to fame, a nation that in measure at least glorified what God can do in the earth through a surrendered people. Through the 120 in the upper room, they walked out into the marketplace, not empowered by a strategy, not with a survey, saying, what will it take you to come to our church? 
but their hearts were filled, their mouths were filled, their lives were filled by the presence and power of God. They recognized, we don't live by making promises to God. We have failed as a nation in our covenant with God. Our part failed, but the good news is God's part of the covenant still stands. If my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, we'll humble ourselves, we'll, we'll truly humble ourselves and say, God, we have not fulfilled what we said we would do. We found ourselves incapable of keeping our promises. Our hearts were too estranged from you. We are too other than what you are. So our promises that we made to you are worthless and it has left our nation in the state that it is today. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. It's as if, it's as if it was the day that Jesus stood in the temple and said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the leader of the temple and wondering what the response of the people was going to be. Will they recognize that he has come or will they just want to throw him off a cliff and hear the next speaker? God Almighty, help us, Lord Jesus Christ. Help us. Could you stand to your feet, please, wherever we are? And I'm going to ask you that maybe join hands with people around you. You might want to form a circle of four or five, six people. And I, I'm going to ask you to unreservedly cry out to God. Unreservedly, unreservedly. Say, Lord, we can't keep our promises, so we come to you because your promises never fail. We ask you for the strength that we need. We ask you for the power. Oh God, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would move upon this audience that's here today and those that are online, and you would give us the grace to open our mouths and begin to pray. You would help us to humble ourselves. You'd help us, my God, to put away our boasting and bragging, put away our flags and banners and all of these other things and just simply bend our hearts before you. God Almighty, we ask you for a spiritual awakening in America, such as we've never seen in our lifetime. We ask you for a mercy moment where millions and millions and millions of people will be drawn into your kingdom. We ask you, Lord, for a harvest so great that nobody could even count it. No church could contain it. We ask you, Lord, to do something that we will know as a nation is you and you alone. It cannot be attributed to a single person other than you. We ask you, God, to visit our homes, visit our families, strengthen our homes. Lord. Give us the grace to put everything out that is weakening us. Give us the grace, my God, to live for you. Bless our homes, bless our families, God. Send your Holy Spirit into our homes. God, help us in the marketplace to stand with the giftings of your Holy Spirit and to honor you in a way that can only be done by your life being lived out inside of each one of us. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, Son of God, do a work that only you can do. Only you can do this work, my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Dark the night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar. Eager souls are waiting, watching, for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother, 
Some poor sailor tempest tossed, trying now to reach the harbor. In the darkness may he be lost. Sing it with me. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may say. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your voice to God. Just take a moment and lift your voice to God. Everyone here. People on a lift your voice to God. Lift your voice to him. Don't be afraid to call out to him. Don't be afraid to ask for his strength. Don't be afraid to accept his cleansing. Don't be afraid. Lift your voice to God. Hallelujah. 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 Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you. And his glory appears over you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See darkness covers the earth and gross darkness is over the people but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you sing it with me arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you see darkness covers the earth and gross darkness is over the people but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Arise, shine. Bride of Christ, arise, shine. Arise by the power of God. Arise by the glory of God's mercy. Arise and become everything that God has called you to be. In this hour of darkness, in this moment, when history seems to be against us, God is still on the throne. Christ, Savior. By God's grace, arise and shine.